Okay, it's five after. Now I'm impatient. <laughs> uh, we can start recording and welcome to the, what is today? August 30th uh, meeting of the Act 65 working group of the RDAP. Um, let's do introductions. I'll go around my screen. Uh, Monica, why don't you start us off? Sure. Good evening, everyone. I'm Monica Weber. I am the Department of Corrections uh, designated to the RDAP panel. Great. Evan. Uh, Evan Meenan with the Vermont Department of State's Attorneys and Sheriffs. Good evening. Good evening. Karen. Hi, everyone. I'm Karen Gannett, Crime Research Group here for technical assistance. Thank you. Rebecca. Rebecca Turner from the Federal General's Office. Elizabeth, and hello. Hello, good evening. Um, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I'm from uh, the Department for Children and Families, our Family Services Division. Um, and I am here on behalf of Tyler, who isn't able to make all of them. Um, so you'll be seeing um, a combination of our faces um, on Mondays the foreseeable future. Thank you. Susanna. Hello, Susanna Davis, Racial Equity Director for the state. Um, Ian. Uh, hi, Ian Loris, uh, Aton Summer Assistant here to compile notes and minutes. Thank you. And I'm Aton, Chair of the panel. Hello. Uh, moving right along, I had Oh, no, I wanted to let everyone know Sheila sends regrets. She couldn't make it tonight. Um, Judge Grierson also wrote, um, I didn't read it really in depth, but he will not be here. Um, and Jess Brown isn't going to be able to make it either. Those are the three regrets that I got. Um, so I don't know if I, I know David Share is somewhere um, attempting attempting to join, but I'm not sure where. Um, so he'll pop up, no doubt, at some point. Um, what I was hoping to do was to, in a certain sense, split the meeting in half. And what I would like to do is begin with the 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 uh, the, the continuing the, the discussion that we had about the mission and um, Karen Gannett did a lot of work on sort of putting together things that were said at the last meeting and I put in uh, the phrase or actually it turned into a sentence with several phrases that Rebecca Turner had pointed out um, about the data. I've sent that to you. Um, and there are some holes in that there regarding the governing body, how that should be constituted. That is um, there. Um, and then there are there's a section that Karen has sort of talked about as nuts and bolts um, for uh, what would you say, Karen, for data handling, data management? Okay. Yes. And so I thought we would start with that, talk about that, and then we'd shift to looking again at that first question about housing the uh, entity. Um, and I would start with Susanna and then move to Evan, who sent through me a couple of documents, which you may not have had time to read because I sent them very late, and I apologize for that. It's been a one of those. And so maybe we'll take a few minutes so people can look at them and then come back and discuss. Um, and that was my plan for this evening. Um, that should take up pretty much our time together. So Karen, why don't you start us off with um, a discussion of the work that you submitted? 
Okie doke. Um, so I will say that the lovely picture that Monica put together um, when we transferred it to other documents kind of took on a life of its own as sometimes those drawings do. Um, and my apologies, for, I, don't, I don't even know why I didn't think about doing it in um, track changes like Evan did, but I didn't. I basically took what was already in the mission document and just took out the extraneous language and put in there, let me pull mine up for myself. Um, um, basically put in there um, the language that you all had already um, added to the mission statement. Eitan added the language that's in blue and I just gave everything a heading. So I gave the mission a heading. I gave the governing body a heading. I'm not sure we actually need that in there after having looked at Evan's documents, but it's something that we, I think we need to discuss about who the governing body should be um, or the advisory committee as, as Evan put it in his documents. Um, for the responsibilities of the Bureau, I basically took all the active language that was in the original document and came up with eight things that were the responsibilities as you all had put in that original document. Um, so for example, reviewing the, the original report, the December report, building the relationships, which has also been of discussion, not only in the document, but in the, in the study committee. Um, working with the governing body or the advisory committee to establish the infrastructure um, to answer the questions in the report of December 2020. And, to, and I thought it was really important to keep in there to create a scalable foundation so that we could build on whatever happened here. Um, develop a data integration governance structure with the help of NCJRP and search follow best practices on data sharing, integration analysis and reporting, including the general principles as to how public data should be protected while maintaining public transparency and trust, um, provide assistance to entities to improve data collection practices, which is another thing that Evan had included in his information, identify the data that can be easily collected or that are already collected and analyze the data and provide information on disparities um, in the original um, document, and I think this is something that Witchy had added to it, was um, the staff that are needed to do this. And then I simply took what Mona Monica had put together, and I do call it the nuts and bolts, which is really the technical aspects of doing data integration. So what do we have? How does it work? Um, in very practical, very practically, how does it work? Um, who has control over the data now? How do we get the data from those in control? And then um, I added Monica's um, picture to the end of it because I thought she did a really, really great job of putting together kind of who's in control of the data, where does it live, where does it have to go? And that's to the, the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics. We're missing some language here. So on the left-hand side in those um, containers, there should be the judiciary, local law enforcement, and you can see public defender and state's attorney. Um, the community research, and I can redo this picture so that it's, um, so that it shows what it should be showing. Community researchers and legislators should go under the question mark at the bottom. And the researchers kind of um, decided to do their own thing and they're floating out on the right-hand side, but there was initially four, four sets of researchers over there just to detail a little bit more who should have access to the data for analysis. And, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has any questions about how I came up with all that. But it, it was really from the initial document, except for the one line that Eitan put in. I don't think I added any language. And that was that was based on, um, I mean, a lot of people were involved in that discussion, but I remember it, I remember 
Rebecca, I remember you starting us off with that. And so I, um, I came up with something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, Evan has his hand up. Oh, yeah, which I, you know, maybe if I looked at the screen, I, <laughs> hi, Evan. <laughs> I know the feeling. Hello. Well, I, I, I don't know if this is a question. It's more of a, maybe it's more of a comment and one that I'll probably reiterate a couple of times, maybe out of forgetfulness. Um, but I see that the Department of State's Attorneys is listed as one of the entities that would feed information into the Bureau of Racial Justice, which is completely fine. Um, but one of the things that I'm trying to keep track of is the specific data points that uh, the department might, might be responsible for sharing so that once those are identified, I can attempt to reach out to RIT folks. Well, I should say folk because there's just one of them, unfortunately. Um, uh, early in the process to make sure that we're capable of reporting it in a way that is easy and not unnecessarily time consuming. Um, and, and I don't I don't have a firm grasp of what those data points might be. So may, maybe this is even a request. Just once those become known, please let me know so that I can work work on that sooner rather than later. And we don't end up being an unanticipated uh, roadblock to this process. Thanks. Monica. I just wanted to make a point that um, when I was putting this together, I was just sort of thinking about like the possibility that all of these entities may at some point need to in the future provide data to the Bureau of Racial Justice Statistics, um, given the conversations that we'd had um, last year and the all of the data that was in the last report that we submitted and all the different places where, where those data were coming from. So if we want to include th this picture, which you know we can or we can't, or I can modify it, I can certainly talk about it as like possibly data sources coming from all these places. Um, but that's what I was just thinking. It's sort of, for me, it was just sort of like conceptual. Um, Got it. Yeah. Okay. That's important. Elizabeth. Hi, I'm wondering, um, and as I read these responsibilities and then look at this, I have to say absolutely fantastic graphic. I feel like it explains it very well. So whoever put it together, Monica, did you do it? Thank you. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm wondering, um, the responsibility of the bureau to report data to the the various state boards that are charged with working on this um, type of work. I'm thinking of uh, you know Susanna's board. Um, my board has um, its own piece, as Judge Davenport has mentioned frequently about ethnic and racial disparities. Um, RDAP, and then many others as well. Um, you know the state likes to likes to create working groups and councils. Um, so I'm wondering if that would sh or should be added to kind of the responsibilities of the Bureau, perhaps even the project manager um, would be to uh, respond to requests for data and also help um, those in those specific councils uh, work through questions as they are trying to uh, come up with policy change or legislative requests, et cetera. But that also might be going a little bit too much into depth with it. Um, Witchy, is that something that project manager could be, uh, oh, I don't know, amended to include that somehow that person, um, I mean, is that appropriate, I guess, A, and B, can it happen? Uh, I'm I'm sorry, but I missed uh, I missed what Elizabeth uh, was saying because I got really distracted. I'm so sorry. Oh, Elizabeth, you can speak for yourself. I don't need to. 
No, that's no problem. I can I can uh, kind of reiterate probably in better wording. I'm wondering if the project manager, um, some of the responsibilities of the bureau and and more specifically the project manager should be to um, provide support to state advisory groups or councils that are trying to take this data and interpret it so that it's done properly. Um, I don't know if that would necessarily mean them, you know, being at every, you know, council meeting or et cetera of all of these different councils, but uh, perhaps when they're reviewing the data that they're present for that, for those conversations and answering questions that might lead to um, misunderstandings on how it's presented. Yeah, I think from my perspective, um, I, I I think yeah, so sort of like a, a little bit of a of a caveat here. Like uh, in my experience, the tech uh, the project manager um, is generally just trying to make sure that everybody's needs are met. Um, you know, including the folks that are asking. Um, I project managers don't always have uh, the knowledge of like data governance, for example. So then it becomes a little bit trickier of like w how it is that they're. Yeah, so uh, so I uh, sorry. So all of that to say, really, just like yes, it can be included, and it should be. It's sort of like when we talk about the job description, it should definitely be included. Like how far, how far the responsibility should go as far as like making decisions about what what data is going to be uh, uh, available. Thank you, Karen. Yeah, one of the things that Robin and I discussed this afternoon, she couldn't make the meeting tonight, um, but was really pretty much in line with what Elizabeth is talking about, and that is where, where Eitan, you added the the blue font, the, the line that's in blue font, is to really include other bodies beside the le besides the legislature. So it really should be state departments, the legislature, and other whether it's advisory councils or community groups. And the other thing that we talked about was um, when the, and I, and I don't know where this goes, but maybe it's under responsibilities, is when the Bureau's data analysts actually do some kind of report to do a, um, a review of the data with, you know, a public review of the data because a lot of times the data doesn't get discussed. And so people don't always review it. And I think that's, um, I think Witchy made a good point is a lot of people misinterpret what's being, what's being revealed. And it's really important for the people doing the data analysis to actually be part of the unveiling of the data and what they're finding. We think that's a really important piece. Okay. Um... Evan, give me a second. I didn't put anything in, by the way, about who gets the data. I didn't do that deliberately. There's nothing in here about that that I wrote. Yeah. And that was a deliberate choice on my part. Like, I didn't want to get into that. I, I, I It just, there are too many, well, well, that just let the cat out of the bag, didn't it? Um, there are too many task forces in state government doing too many overlapping projects all around this stuff, and I ain't naming all of them. I, I, somebody wants to do that, have a very good time. But I really didn't want to get into it because they come, they go, five people serve on one, they're all living in the same household. I mean, it's just... It's too much, and I didn't want to get into it. But if I should get into it, you know, let me know, and I'll get into it. Um, Evan. Um, yeah, the, the number of policy and work groups definitely gives me a chuckle sometimes, too. But, uh, you know, I, I thought maybe in response to Karen's comment, you know, maybe, well, I, I guess I had two thoughts, the first of which was, where do we envision this mission statement residing? Um, because I think there's a couple of different options. It could certainly reside in the enabling legislation of RDAP. That's one potential um, uh, residency. Another would be 
what we would recommend the mission statement to be in our whatever report that we issue in response to our charge. And then the third potential place would be for the Bureau or whatever it ends up being called to sort of promulgate its own mission statement consisting consistent with its enabling legislation. That would be a third option. Um, one thing that would that could be possible regardless of where it resides would be for us not to recommend um, specific entities where this data would be disclosed. So, for example, that sentence in uh, blue font could just read the data are to be used along with the biennial uh, reports from RDAP to inform policy decisions and just eliminate the word legislative yes. and then that way for example the legislature could rely on the data but so too could the judiciary or the department of state's attorneys or corrections or defender general's office or whoever has relevant data that might need or desire to reform their practices based on identified uh, disparities from the Bureau. Okay. Great. I, I you know, you raise a, an interesting point, Evan. I, I, I did think we were doing the uh, enabling I th we're doing draft legislation at the towards the end of all of this, but in terms of the bureau's mission statement, I have we even been. I don't think we've been asked. We've been asked to put it in a report or to address it in a report, but nothing more weighty that I see so far. Have I missed something? I I think I, I was just pulling it up now. Act sixty five. My recollection, and excuse me if I'm incorrect, was that Act sixty five directed our report to contain enabling legislation, um, or or not necessarily enabling legislation, but um, some type of some type of recommended yeah on page 21 it says the report required by subsection a of this section shall include proposed draft legislation that's not necessarily synonymous with enabling legislation unless we decide that the bureau has to be some sort of standalone entity that needs its own enabling legislation as opposed to just vesting an existing entity in its current configuration with more authority. Okay. So I guess conceivably there's a couple different directions we could go with. Okay. All right. Thank you. Rebecca. So I'm, I'm desperately trying to connect my um, trap changes uh to this group here and then walk through it so just give me a second if you don't mind um and i'm just dropping some of the just trying to get that out and then it'll be easier for me to share my comments oh is this a talk amongst yourselves moment or this is a this is a talk amongst yourselves although i can i can chat well although i'll be distracted so I, let me i'd rather just wait so if others want to talk and join oh. in that'd be good Okay. You know, I have to admit, Evan, I, I, I had a fantasy. I guess I'm saying this to everyone. And my fantasy was we'd write the report. Um, I would email Martin Lalonde and say, you should get Eric here to, here, go write legislation now. Because <laughs> um, there's a part of me I know what it says in there, 
and maybe I should stop being so rebellious about this, but lawmakers write legislation. That's why they're elected, is to write legislation. So how about they do their job and we do our job and, you know, it'll all work out. Just the thought. I mean, because I, I was really thinking, you know, I really was. Look at a report done. They really are very clear. The report shall address one, two, three, four, five. Let's do that. And then, you know, okay. <laughs> Here, here's our, our draft of our report. I, you guys should, uh, you, I mean, Representative Lalonde even said we should, he wouldn't be able to come to all of these meetings, but we should let him know when it got, was getting down to the wire and he needed to do, you know, his part because legislative council can't be here without a legislator. So, and I had sort of said when they were drafting this, oh, so Ledge Council will just be at the meetings. Oh, no, that can't happen. And I had a little bit of a fit. But then everyone explained that it would be okay. And so I stopped having a fit. Um, Rebecca, are you ready? I've hopefully sent something to you guys, which should be what Karen worked on with Aton. Um, in a moment to just try to give you guys my um, my feedback. I think overall, um, thanks, Karen, for your work on that with Aton and others who worked with sure. you guys on that this week. Um, I think overall, A, I want to just keep reminding everyone that let's just watch our language. Like I've already expressed, and I just don't want to use up time again repeating the same things about the why I don't like the word bureau. Um, and my understanding from, I understand it's in the legislation. I, I understand also why it was picked and it was pretty, it was a placeholder. Um, I just, I think it, it is the FBI, right? Um, so it just, it's just, as a, I just hope, can we just keep calling the data entity? Um, the other thing that's more of just like a, a technical thing. The other thing I just want to make a point is I feel like I, I, when this started in the beginning of August, I shared a draft. And I feel like that got lost. And so I re-injected it. And I think it's appropriate to sort of return to what I was, the main points there, particularly as I see Monica's drawing and as, as it's sort of being built upon and described here, what I see are the key differences, because there's a lot of things that are similar. So if we can just jump there, that's really sort of the heart of, of it. And I think it captures a lot of what we're talking about. Um, not really getting to the questions as to what we should do next and draft legislation or not. But if you guys go to page three, this is a familiar chart of what I shared at the beginning um, when I shared also the AISP's toolkit for how to design and think about uh, a data aggregation um, entity in state government and how to make sure when we're trying to address racial equities to not lose the critical voices, right? And we started off August talking about, but I feel like the document that's starting to emerge has completely dropped off. I know there's sort of language in the governing body uh, to that effect, but the image itself that's developing here as to who's involved in this makes no mention of community members, people with lived experiences, mm -hmm. right? The other thing it doesn't make any mention of is the role of the governing board. So just take a look at number three. Because this is this was this isn't there's a, it's a slight edit, but a critical edit from the last version you saw. And that is that the last time you saw these, there was no big blue circle there. What you saw were three separate circles, governing board dedicated to juvenile justice issues governing board dedicated to criminal justice issues because while there's a lot of overlapping similar players that would be involved we're always um i guess for the newer members it's something that we realize we're giving short shrift to the juvenile justice side of things we quickly focus on the criminal this was a way a to just keep us honest about making sure that when we approach any data uh project that we don't give short shrift to this. It also provides a sample of how we could um, 
I want to call it level up, but it's not level up. Expand this beyond racial equities issues, right? Imagine a governing board related to education or health or mm -hmm. all the places where we're seeing the legislature want to take what RDAP's thinking about and make it bigger than racial equities in the criminal and juvenile justice system. So imagine this data entity, wherever we decide to suggest putting it within executive, the executive branch, um, that, that there is this this executive director or however we want to title it with the requisite staff and again whatever we think is appropriate but that that body takes not just advisory government advice from an advisory board but is governed by these individual governing boards mm -hmm. right and so then the question is and again keeping the center on making sure we don't exacerbate continue, embed new implicit biases that we don't actually realize we're doing when we're dealing with this data uh, project, that we have a governing board where we don't just, because this is where I'm worried about what Monica's conceived here, there is no mention of, of, of community members and people with lived experiences. And just a reminder, remember when we lived through last session, there was this moment where the legislators wanted to make RDAP the members of RDAP, the panel, the effective governing board, right? Um, and I think that's an important recognition we're dropping off here, right? Um, and, and I just wanna make sure speaking for the community members who can't make it tonight, I know that's just a critical piece and it's a non-starter to present any image that just drops off the people who are actually impacted. So I just wanna start that. The other is that it's critical to understand for me Again, not just in a concern of independence, but accountability throughout this process, whatever stage at the micro and macro level of this, as it gets going, that there are these constant checks. Again, how AISP toolkit returning us to that sort of that thinking of how to make sure there's accountability and checks throughout all of these. And I think I keep returning, well, it's critical to the governing body, right? And the governing body and the executive director follows what the governing body tells them. That these outside government agencies, again, covered in that outside circle, are obviously feeding in the necessary data, right? We have the analytical side that may have to be contracted out, supporting the executive director and staff to get the job done. Um, that's where CRG, UVM, others could come in, right? I don't see these as being within the state government entity itself that we're talking about, but outside. Again, I just don't know if others feel like this is a non-starter, but to me, fundamentally, what Monica's drawn up is at odds with how I've been thinking of all of our core ideas of what the data entity is. I remember there being, I remember writing, I don't know where it went, something where I, I the governing body was first, and that that was something that the um, bureau listened to. <laughs> and I don't know where that went. I remember doing that, but Karen. Let me unmute myself. I think that's a really important point that you bring up, Rebecca. I, so let me see if I can say this and be clear about how I see this. So I think when you look at what was written both in the mission statement and in um, Evan's draft of the legislation, I think the advisory committee, and maybe it needs to be advisory committees are exactly what you drew up. Um, so they are, so those are the governing bodies that are going to be guiding the data entity. And I, I don't like the word bureau either, but just didn't know what else to put in there. So I just kind of did what everybody, you know, just kind of followed that through. I'm glad you changed the language. Um, what Monica drew up and what, um, what we've been talking about around this other subcommittee is really the, and that's why I call it the nuts and bolts of doing the technical work. So those aren't governing bodies. 
those aren't anybody that's going to be driving or guiding what the advisory committee or the data entity are going to be doing. It's really the nuts and bolts of how we get the data from one place to the next place and who feeds that data in there. So maybe we need something that's more, um, I don't want to say more of an overlay because then it gets really complicated, but a line from Monica's drawing, and may, Mo, Monica just raised her hand, so maybe she has a better idea than I do, um, but a, but a, almost like a, a funnel from Monica's drawing to your drawing, because that's how we get the data. And then we need to put the data somewhere, and that's the governing bodies, the advisory committee, the data entity. But there's a whole lot of really technical stuff that has to happen before that, and that is things like um, ADS has to be made aware of this, and there needs to be data sharing agreements. And the, you know, I know in our contracts we have what's called attachment D, like how you can use the data, what you do with the data, who gets the data, who doesn't get the data. And so there are actually written documents that have to be done. And I consider those kind of the nuts and bolts of the sharing of the data. So that's how I see Monica's drawing of it is, and that's why I called it the nuts and bolts, because it really is kind of the technical pieces of getting the data out of the systems, the actual systems, and then handing it over to the governance committees and the, the data the data entity that you're talking about. I think what you drew is really the um, conceptual framework for the advisory committee of the data entity. So there's the nuts and bolts and there's the actual guiding advisory committee. I'll shut up now because I think I... Evan? And then Monica. Yeah, I just wanted to take a minute and follow up on on what Rebecca said um, because I, I don't I, I don't necessarily disagree with any of it, but um, you know my my thoughts about my thoughts in general about um, a governing entity or panel or whatever it's going to end up being called um, are influenced fairly heavily by. Um, my experience wor working for the Natural Resources Board, which is a board consisting of several members drawn from the community um, with varying level of levels of experience with um, Act 250, the subject matter of the board, uh, and who only receive the per diem allotted by statute. And I know that compensation is something that this group has rightfully talked about before. And so I would I would just say that I you know it it can be difficult to build um, institutional knowledge and encourage engagement amongst a group of uh, com volunteer community members who are a part of any sort of governmental entity um, and so uh, in, in it's not impossible, but it can be difficult. And I think that um, that difficulty could possibly be overcome by either suggesting that the legislature revisit the topic of compensation or by assigning very specific and concrete tasks to the entity so that there's a clear mission statement rather than it just being some sort of advisory panel or group. And so, you know, I, I, I definitely agree that people with lived experience and community members should be a part of whatever panel is, uh, is constituted. But I, I think that we need to make sure that we structure it in a way where they have sufficient familiarity with what this data entity is 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 supposed is expected to accomplish and that they are justly compensated for their work um, and i think sometimes that can be overlooked uh, in statute 
uh, at least based on my experience. So I, I, I'm, I'm not necessarily agreeing or disagreeing. I'm just laying out some additional things for, uh, for consideration to make it a meaningful exercise. Monica? Mm, thanks, Eitan. Yeah, um, just to pick up a little bit on what Karen said. So the purpose of my drawing really was to help my thinking evolve around um, where would be the most efficient way or how would how would data move back and forth, right? And sort of helping me answer the question about where a data entity could live. And so that's all I put on this drawing for my own thinking. When we get to a place where we have a collective better understanding around governing body, advisory body, I do think Karen's suggestion makes perfect sense, right? But we would have this overlay of whatever this larger entity is and a connection to whatever a final version of this particular graph, which is easily changed. You know, there's lots of editing that, that can be done so that we could show like the two different layers, the nuts and bolts layers, and then sort of maybe what I would call like the larger sort of policy layer or um, governing layer. Um, but this wasn't intended to really um, show that governing piece. It was to show how data gets moved around. So in other words, in, in a way, your drawing, Monica, is around towards questions four and five, whereas what Rebecca and the rest of us are looking at are really around three, to some extent two, and certainly, I guess, one as well, the first three questions. So it's it, it in fact, I mean, at least that's what I'm looking at is that it's it's different different intents. Yes. Um, I think Karen was getting at that. I would say then what we would need is it's unfortunate that we didn't we we really probably ought to look at filling in the governing body and really critiquing that language and seeing if that's I'm looking at Rebecca's thing right now um yeah I mean looking are. at looking at what Rebecca's drew looking at what Evan wrote and if there's some other things I don't I know Susanna I, I, yeah yeah so you know like and then whatever it is we want I can make it into a drawing. I like to draw things, so I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. So that it wasn't like I was trying to leave out those things. It was not for that purpose. Okay. That's helpful, you guys. Thanks, Karen and Monica, for clarifying. Can you can you tell me who are these like great researchers who? Are We've got these like super high tech free. You know, the point, I think the point there was that we decided that there were going to be researchers who, you know, may want access to the data, but they're not part of the data entity. But there are some researchers within the entity. So it's just showing that there's, there's people out there who are going to potentially want to access this data and they're different. Um, and tell me what the circle around e ADS is. The ADS is circle around DPS, DOC, and DCF. And so not. if you're in an executive branch organization, all of the data that is in those different agencies is controlled by the Agency of Digital Services. There's no way to get around working with the Agency of Digital Services. It has to be part of the process. And that was the other thing that I was trying to show here is that there are some data that comes from the Agency of Digital Services or that they sort of control. And then I may be wrong. This is just my understanding from other conversations. The judiciary has its own kind of entity and all their law enforcement, the Defender General, right? Not within the Agency of Digital Services. Even though we're executive, even though state's attorneys is executive. So it's not so simplest. Okay, I got it. I got it. So these are... 
And Department of Ed, I know we're not including them, but I, uh, Sheila, has, we have it in our data collection point to collect some data from Department of Ed. That would be a whole other thing to put on here. That would, yeah, I don't know how their data is controlled. Yeah, you don't know if it's a ADS? Probably is. Does uh, anyone know the answer to that? I would guess it is, yeah. Evan says, is that no, Evan, or you don't know? I It probably is, but who knows? I have I have no, no clue <laughs> um, how how ADS manages data and for whom it manages data. I can certainly find that out and put that in there. But my one of the main points of for me doing this was to show the heavy influence that ADS will have over this project. Does that we, mean to in terms of of agreements with individual government organizations that will be providing the data? that it's ADS who will be the critical, or is there a sub-requirement to have separate agreements with DOC and this data entity, DCL, DOE? You need separate agreements, but the agreements will be um, uh, sort of within the template that ADS provides from organizing data exchanges. But each entity would have to use, you'd have to. Each commissioner has to sign off ultimately, or whoever. I mean, that's my understanding about how it could work now. I, it, who knows what's possible? The Which is nuts, sorry, I, and I appreciate the nuts and bolts detail. I don't want to get into the detail, but to the extent that it starts impacting how I'm thinking about the bigger entity and governing body and where it should sit and all of these things, like who has the muscle? We talked about this previously to make sure that this isn't just like a please give us your data and people uh, or organizations can just not necessarily cooperate, right? Like who has, um, who has the ability to make sure these agreements happen and um, what happens if they don't, right? Um, I don't know if you guys have some ideas on that in terms of how that affects structurally how we're talking about things being set up here or not. Good question. Anybody? Oh, Evan. Um, well, honestly, before just now, in Monica's comments, that was something that I was struggling with because um, I, I, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure that was something we were su supposed to address, and I didn't know how we were going to do it. Right. I mean, one state entity um, trying to enforce uh, uh, something against another state entity on its face seems to create an awkward situation. Um, but but I wonder if if Monica is correct, that ADS would have um, a meaningful level of involvement in this process as a result of its control over entities, other enti other state entities data, and maybe that's something that we need to confirm. M maybe it's not as big of a problem as we were thinking, right? Because perhaps, and I don't know this, so I, I don't wanna state it definitively, but if ADS has the ability to independently report data or uh, coerce an entity to, to report data, Maybe there's a solution there, and I, I don't know, but but maybe. Richie. I just, I guess I have, you know, maybe I just don't understand the politics here, but why would a state agency deny another state agency the right to be able to analyze our data if it was if it's by law that this is supposed to happen Karen do you want to feel that because my feeling is you've had some experience with this maybe I'm wrong if I'm wrong just tell me I'm wrong first of all I, I you're well, I have had some experience with getting data from state departments, um, but I'm not a state department, so we're not coercing anybody. You know, we're not a state department coercing somebody else to hand over data. 
but there is a process that we have to go through. There are there is a um, data sharing agreement, and there is a, what's called an ISA, um, interagency. I'm going to say it wrong, Monica. What is it? An ISA security agreement. There you go, interagency <laughs> security agreement. So there, and so what happens with each department? And and Monica's right. We have to go through every department and have a different agreement because there are different data sets from every department. So we have to actually talk with them, have several conversations with them about what are the actual data fields. And it gets, that's why I said it's nuts and bolts. It gets very technical. What are the actual data fields and what's the name of, what's the code for that field that we wanna get so we know we're getting the right data. Um, we're kind of getting into the weeds on this, but it's it's a very technical issue around getting data from a state department. And that's why you need one from every department because they're the ones in control of their data. So law enforcement controls their data, DOC controls their data, um, all the state departments control their own data. And you have to know what you want in order to get the correct data fields to do your analysis. So it's a conversation. There's a whole process. It's a conversation. The data fields actually go in the document. So when I do a, an agreement with, um, and Monica and I have, have done this before, when we do a data sharing agreement, I have conversations with the data people in her um, department, and we talk about what data are actually in their system. And what's, so we'll say, well, we want... I don't know, some field of data, and they'll say, well, oh, okay, well, that data is coded as this, and the, the code, the name of the data field actually goes in the document. So there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of conversation, and if you don't do that piece of it, you may not get the data you need to do the analysis. Yeah, that all, that all makes sense to me, but they wouldn't deny, like, for example, if you were a state agency, they wouldn't necessarily deny data, right? Because I feel like that was the, what I was hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a that's a really good question, Witchy. I, I've i not had any, I'm trying to think about who I've had that might have denied data. It might not be available. What we might, might what we want might not be in their data system. Um, and that's where we have the conversation with them. Um, I can't think of, I mean, I haven't worked with all state departments, but the ones we've talked to have not, um, have, haven't said no. We've had, you know, there's some that have been a little reluctant and want to know more about what we're going to do with the data, but I haven't had, had people say no. And I do want to say that there are some data systems where it's, um, and I think Evan makes this point really well and has made it time and again, so he doesn't forget it and neither do we, that some systems you just can't get data out of them. So, you know, as people are building their systems, that's one reason, that's one of the reasons we actually need, and I, we've called it a governance entity because that's what search calls it, but a governance committee that has policy people and technical people on it. So we can have the conversations about what changes they're making in their system. So the users of those systems don't get surprised by not being able to access data because they've made changes and, oh, geez, they changed a code. And, you know, for example, at one point, the ju I'll pick on the judiciary, they're not here. Back in November of 2018, they coded probation differently. And they never told the end users of the system. So DOC didn't know, BCIC didn't know for criminal histories, and we didn't know for data requests. So a year later, Robin's like, something's off here. I'm not getting probation sentences for the data requests. And we called the judiciary and they're like, oh, we changed that field name. <laughs> so now we have to fix it. So, you know, if we have this governance entity, we want to be able to converse with each other quarterly about the changes that are happening in the systems so we're all aware of the effect it has on the data analysts and the researchers that are using that data. So let me 
I, I, Monica and then Rebecca, but let me just put in a moment here. Um, so I've been writing while you were speaking, Karen, and sort of working on the document that Rebecca and you and I and so everybody's been working on, the governing body. Um, the governing body shall consist of, and I'm not writing this in like, you know, what we would call, I suppose, legislative English, but um, real people and data folks who understand systems and their negotiations. So I'm just putting those two in as like big categories to start with, because Karen, your point about that this governing body would need to have people who can do both, that you would have to have people who can speak data along with people who can speak policy. Does that make sense? So I see this as two separate groups. So the governing body on the top is the governing body that Rebecca is talking about. I would put the other, and we got to talk about different names for these things, um, but the other governing body I would put under the nuts and bolts. What you just said, Eitan, I'd put under nuts and bolts. Okay. That's what that governing body should be doing is is meeting quarterly and making sure that they're talking to each other about changes they're making in their system. Okay. But the governing body for the data entity should be what Rebecca is referring to. Got it. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Monica. Uh, okay. A couple of points um, just around I think it started with Witchy's question, and I think we sort of answered it that if the legislation or whatever it is that creates this entity requires departments to share data, then departments can share data, right? That would be the en enforcement piece of it in my mind. Um, the other thing is to say that and I think Karen made this point, but I want to reiterate it. A ADS doesn't own the department data. So the Department of Corrections owns our data. ADS has requirements, systems, um, procedures that must be met in order when we store, when we share, uh, you know, all of the things around keeping data protected. Um, particularly data like the Department of Corrections and DCF, where you know a lot of our data is is not considered public data, right? So we have we have to make sure. Um, so ADS has all of those systems in place. They can't come into our offender management system, pull our data, and give it to someone else. We're the ones that do that with their assistance and with the guidance that they set. Um, so that's an uh, that's a very distinct difference that I I wanted to make for people. Um, and then lastly, I agree, Karen, with your idea. That they're really, I was thinking about those as two different entities as well, right? Okay. Some sort of infrastructure group and then the governing group that has, that really is the high level picture. Okay. Thank you. I needed that clarified. Yeah. Can I ask that we move on to the second part of the discussion this evening that I asked about? Um, which has to do with um, different questions about location. I think that there's going to be some interesting overlap here um, in this discussion. Um, and I would like to give the floor to Susanna um, to describe, there's no written document here. It was, it was, a, it was something, it grew out of a conversation that she and I had. And so, Susanna, floor is yours. All right. This is going to take very little time because, as Eitan says, there's no formal write-up about it. Um, and it, it, I mean, you all can figure it out. So the short story is that this is being uh, offered not necessarily to say we shouldn't do any, el any of what else has been proposed, but just as a, hey, have we also thought about this? which is um, to consider placing this entity in or in the orbit of 
the new Criminal Justice Council. I'm just pausing so that your cogs can turn. <laughs> so what that would mean, so what that would mean is um, that this, so, so let me just back up actually and talk a little bit about the reformed, I don't want to say reform because that has like punitive connotations, but the redesigned Criminal Justice Con, uh, Council, which now has been expanded to include a lot more members, including more community members. Um, it is far less law enforcement heavy than it used to be and is also the, the, the statutory language now is broader so that it can encompass more than the more narrow aspect of training that it used to be more focused on. So, um, so the Criminal Justice Council currently enjoys administrative support. It is already sort of connected and yet has some degree of independence because it does serve watchdog functions. So it does live in that murky area that permits it to be supported by an agency somewhere or a department somewhere, but also be independent enough that it can do that critical thinking and analysis that it would need to do. Um, so I think that in terms of setting up a new entity, um, again, I, I don't necessarily discourage that, but it, it is worth exploring the possibility of housing this in a place that already does have administrative support, particularly if we would be uh, building a staff with this, the, the four uh, positions that we had been talking about, then this would not necessarily add to the existing burden of the council, but ra well, it would, but with the additional resources that we've already outlined. Um, the council does have an executive director. It has a chair, two co-vice chairs. And for disclosure, I am one of those co-vice chairs. Um, it also has a number of representatives from law enforcement and a number of community reps as well. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave it there. That's, that's the thought. If I, I would just add on to that, that part of what our discussion also included was, and I, I think I feel this strong, more strongly than I had imagined at the time that Susanna and I had this discussion. Um, th we, there's a task force that, is that what we call it, Susanna? I can't remember anymore of, of, of the racial equity work groups. There's like the group that you came up with of all of us. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, we're calling it the symposium, which is just a, right. a convening of all of the work groups that exist that touch racial equity in some way. I have a slide I can show if anyone's interested, but no pressure, I don't have to, but there are a lot of entities. And there, and this, this body came together, thank you, Susan, <laughs> because there are, as we, there are so many entities and there are, just so many people, meaning a limited group of people who serve on these things. And we didn't actually know that each other was involved in whatever we were involved in. And then we had this task force and we're all sitting around a table staring at each other and going, oh, wow, look at that. Um, you do that too? Okay. And the, there was a certain sense here when in our discussion about um, not to what extent is this entire data entity duplicative? And is there some way in which we could stop this? Because I certainly know in communities of color, there is a tremendous fatigue at this point with yet another group that the legislature has come up with. Um, and cynicism, not just fatigue, but cynicism. So I'll stop there. Witchy, your hand was up first, then Rebecca. Yeah, definitely wanting to echo sort of Aton's thoughts on people of color and and things that the legislature comes up with just like especially just, I just feel like people are generally exhausted uh, but I do so I do like the idea of housing it somewhere it already exists um I, I guess my follow-up question to you um Susana about the about the criminal justice 
council. I, I can't, can't remember the name, um, but uh, something that I that I want to note is like the 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 what's going to happen with that data entity and what they're going to research and stuff is will, will always be the agenda of whoever is governing it. So what are the functions then of the criminal justice council and how do you feel that the data entity, if it was housed under this council, how, how do you foresee their gears being guided? Yeah. So, um, ooh, this doesn't look good that I don't, <laughs> have it tattooed on me yet, but the functions loosely speaking are to oversee the training and the police academy for all anyone who's going to be a law enforcement officer in the state, of course, has to go to the same academy. And so I, I think one of its primary functions is um, that training, which includes things like curriculum development and the physical space of the academy, et cetera. Um, another of its functions is to hold hearings when there's a disciplinary matter that's being contested with, you know, if an officer is accused of misconduct or something like that, um, if it is being contested, it goes to a hearing and the council hears those matters. Um, so that's another of its functions. Another one is um, they have a subcommittee on fair and impartial policing. So right now the fair and impartial policing policy is under revision and it's currently being looked at by that subcommittee. So it really does run the gamut in terms of um, a lot of aspects of law enforcement particularly those that have to do with training, new hires, and sort of introductory policy. Um, that is kind of where it is now. Obviously, in order to do that, it does rely on a lot of data. And, um, and they do have a, a, the representation of the council gives it access, it gives it eyes in a lot of spaces. I'll say that. I'm also just going to pause really quickly and find the bill um, that redesigned it this past session and put it in the chat. Great, thanks. Rebecca, you disappeared for a moment. I got very nervous, but you're back. Yeah. Okay. No, my, my internet was spotty and failed for a moment. Uh -huh. And I hear you about the cynicism and the over overextension of representatives of um, the BIPOC community. Uh, speaking personally about this and, and I can understand. <laughs> I also am very sensitive to not wanting to be part of an effort to build something so complicated, huge and important that fundamentally is not going to be accepted as valid or independent. And, and unfortunately, the um, council from the Defender General's perspective is all law enforcement. It is not when, when I mean, from the very beginning of, of us on our DAP, when we conceived this, it was critical that it be independent, right? No one suggested the AGO, no one suggested um, the state's attorney's office. You and, and Susanna, I appreciate you looking for the specific section because everyone should look at where the council lives in our code. It's Title 20. It is the purposes, overarching purposes, is law enforcement, public safety. Um, Susanna shared a little bit of it in terms of training. It's law enforcement. Everything goes back to law enforcement. This isn't the purpose of this data. It isn't about accountability of police officers generally, right, for terms of training. This is bigger. This is bigger, and we also need to be able to trust it. I think if we want to avoid furthering for cynicism, the last thing we should do is, is turn to a place that is historically and just even if I recognize that it was just amended on uh, the statute, but um, for me, it's critical. Who are on, who's on this governing board? What's the independence and what are the numbers? We don't just want one or two, and I don't, I'm not saying the council has one or two count community members, no. but let's think about whose voices and how those voices are heard. Are they, um, are they a minority group? Are they just there to just, you know, is it, where are where are the interests? I think it's critical. I, I so I appreciate what you're looking to, and I recognize and agree. We, like agreement points, a place that is established so that the legislature just can't yank funding. That's so critically important, right? A place that has infrastructure, a place that will exude enough gravitas, uh, not just so that the legislature keeps funding it, but the other state 
organizations give the data, which you asked, you know, politically, how is it that there can be a law passed requiring data sharing and it not happen? I mean, Karen shared a little bit of, of sort of some of the technical details that can happen just in terms of how long it can take for an agreement to not necessarily bad motive or ill intent. Um, the, rea the net result, though, is that there's foot dragging and and months and months and months where people are trying to get something which seems simple never happens. So um, I don't mean to, but I did want to just plug in enforcement has to be more than just we require data. It has to have a, a, a stick and, and similar to other legislation where funding, you know, consequence of not providing this in a timely manner means you lose funding, period. And, and we have we have model legislation to follow. Mm -hmm. Another avenue. So I would, that's one way, but the other is who is it? And Karen and Monica, when you were talking about sort of that funnel detail of the nuts and bolts and suggesting sort of a board that could navigate all of those different agreements that would be necessary, I wondered if it could, and again, maybe we don't, maybe we need another board within that nuts and bolts details. Maybe it's the executive director or the position itself uh, that has that power to just be like, hey, you were, you know, the legislation says you gotta, you gotta provide this data by whatever date. It's not here. Let's get it over. And, and I mean, and there's nothing more to do but to pull funding, right? Or however else the consequences should go. Anyways, my two cents. Uh, and also, I know that I promised, and I just didn't get there because I landed on Thursday back here in Vermont, uh, to still be un un uh, undug is to try to connect with folks in the Secretary of State's. Uh, office, not necessarily because they said yes, they haven't given any indication that they are even wanting this <laughs> to land there. But I'm curious how such what what input and and um, advice they can share in terms of how how this data entity could be set up and um, possible things to think about models. Um, anyways, so I, I I hope to bring that to our next meeting. Just didn't get there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elizabeth. Um, and just to add to um, the conversation regarding the Criminal Justice Council, I'm I'm curious what the focus on the juvenile side of things are for the council and looking at the membership piece that was in that, Susanna, you just put in the chat and thanks for that. I don't see any um, focus on, on youth. Um, and obviously I'm going to be the person to, to ring that bell. Um, so just considering that as well, if it were to be under this entity. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. Um, I think they're all excellent points that were just made. And, you know, the current, um, the current iteration of the council is a reformation of what it used to be. And, um, you know, if we did consider putting this there, then what we, I'm getting a bad network, so I'm going to turn my video off. Um, and if we were to amend this to put it in with the council, then we would be creating a new reformation of what that could be, right? So um, I definitely agree that the current composition doesn't reflect the, the important focus on youth and that that's likely something that we could also change if we needed to. Um, you know, and, and I think the question really comes down to, do we want to create multiple disconnected entities to do the various, to touch the elephant in different spots? Um, or do we want to start plugging them in and, and what's the word, when you consolidate a little bit? Um, and if we do consolidate, what harm does that create? Are we putting, um, are, we, are we putting people in charge of policing themselves, basically? Or are we giving more opportunity for community involvement in things where they've historically not been present? I think these are all open questions. Um, so yeah, again, I don't, I don't, I'm not wedded to this or any of the other ideas, but I didn't recall having heard it before. So I just want to make sure that this group, um, being aware of how bureaucracy can grow rapidly, you know, is at least aware of this as a possibility. Okay, that actually leads to a really interesting segue because Susanna was talking about the reformation of the council and 
that if we were to think of this, that there would be yet another reformation that would have to happen around the issue of youth at least. Um, so that actually brings us to what Evan was proposing, because that's a reformation too, in a very different way, not very different way, a different way. Um, and I thought that maybe we should also hear that at the moment, rather than try to tie anything off, which we're never very good at anyway, so let's not. So Evan, would you like to, uh, to present your work? Uh, absolutely, yeah, I'm happy to do so. So, so if, um, I'm not sure if everyone who's on tonight's call was on last week's call because sometimes the attendance list is uh, inconsistent, not necessarily in a bad way. Um, and so what I wanted to, so, so I'll, I'll just recap first. So at the last meeting, there was some discussion about two different concepts. The first of which was, um, would Susanna's office be an appropriate landing place for this, um, data collection entity? Won't call it a bureau anymore. Um, given the fact that um, Susanna's office all, already has some data collection responsibilities in its enabling legislation, and the scope of her office doesn't just relate to juvenile and criminal justice, but to state government as a whole, therefore providing this entity with a little bit of elbow room to grow. And then the second thing that we discussed was whether the whatever advisory panel or advisory group whatever it ends up governing entity whatever it ends up being called um, should resemble at least to some degree the makeup of the criminal justice council which we've been discussing so what i attempted to do for discussion purposes was illustrate um, how those two changes might look on paper. Um, the best way that I could do that myself was, was just to draft some legislation. Um, and then at Aton's suggestion, which was a good one, with a little bit of a memo uh, to instruct the reader of the legislation. Um, and so what I attempted to do was and, and so and I should also say there's already a connection to 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 some degree although a little bit limited between Susanna's office and um, and then also the agency of administration. So given that connection, I thought maybe the agency of administration would be a good place to house this data collection entity, although there could be other suitable homes. And so uh, the legislation that I drafted did three things. It amended the enabling legislation for the agency of administration to uh, include what would be a actual department of racial equity, as opposed to just uh, you know, a racial equity director so Susanna's position would be elevated to a commissioner uh, position and then amended the enabling legislation for, uh, well, the existing enabling legislation for Susanna's office to expand the scope of its duties so that it could accomplish some of the things that um, the legislature envisioned this data collection entity could accomplish in Act uh, 65. And then the last thing that it did was it attempted to mesh the composition of the existing racial equity panel with the composition of the Criminal Justice Council. Um, I you know, one thing that I did notice, which Rebecca kind of flagged already for us, was that um, the composition 
the existing composition of the council is is arguably very law enforcement heavy. So, for example, one entity that is notably absent is the Defender General's office, which plays a pretty significant role in our criminal justice system. And so I did add that in. But aside from that, I, I didn't attempt to take too many liberties with the composition of the group. I, I wanted to try and mesh them and then add the Defender General's office, thinking that that might be a good starting place for a discussion. Um, so really, hopefully this, this draft is illustrative um, and is really a jumping off point for a conversation. But I, I, you know, I do think that there's probably a couple of homes for this entity that could exist within existing parts of state government. And, and this is just designed to illustrate how one of them might function. Okay. Thank you. You all may not, and I, I want to apologize again, you all may not have had enough time. I had a horrible day and I got, the, Evan and I were in contact, I think he emailed me at about 11 o'clock this morning and I did not get it until about four o'clock this afternoon. And so I did what I curse everyone else for doing, which is send out a huge document just before a meeting. I hate it when people do that. I call them names and I did it. So that will teach me some humility perhaps. Um, would people, there are a couple options as I see it right now. It's 726. We could take this and have literally two weeks to digest everything that's gone on tonight. Um, I would love to take another crack at that mission statement again, keeping in mind the stuff that Karen and Monica put in, and I want to go back to the version that Rebecca, oh, I want to go back and look at all her red, basically. Um, I think it would also give us time to really digest what Evan's done, which is this sort of Herculean task of synthesis. Um, and then, you know, I mean, it sounds what Susanna and I both were sort of proposing has some holes in it. They're not completely separate from the holes that Evan is noting in his own work. So there are a lot of questions here. The other issue being that Rebecca wants some time to speak with the Secretary of State. Um, I'm bringing it up right now because we really do have two weeks for this because next week is Labor Day, oddly named since the idea is no one's supposed to labor. Um, but we, that means we're not meeting, which gives us a fair amount of time in which to get all of this done. So I'm putting that out there as, I mean, because if people haven't been able to read what Evan's done, um, I'm, you know, I'm perfectly willing to take 10 minutes to let people do that, but that's kind of a rush job. Um, and so I'd like to have a little discussion on what I'm proposing. Sounds like a good proposal to me, Aton. You're, you're up for that? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, 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 I don't have. I think people should have sufficient time to marinate on on some of the written materials. So I, I, I have no issues at all with your proposal, and so it makes sense to me. Okay. Me too, you know, and I, I really want this is really a, a critical, important piece, which is thinking about who should be on the governing board. Um, and I think that it's great to, absolutely great to pull uh, what's been already established in our state laws. And that's a really great, useful piece. What I'm struck every time we try to pull and find an easy way to do a map is that a match is that this is different and, and we have to do it right. And, and particularly just making sure we're not embedding in this entity, just more biases 
right? Um, and so I, to me, it's the seats are so critical. So I, I do appreciate the idea of two weeks that gives us some time to think about. I certainly plan to propose um, who I think should all, should be included um, and why and, to sh and and hopefully, I just came back from a Colorado conference with um, judiciary and uh, it was related to child welfare, but a lot of exciting connections related to data and how how folks are coming together to to talk uh, about this in, uh, on, on an organizational level. So I'm just, I'm hoping to pull and, and see how it's done elsewhere. I know there are great models. Um, so two weeks is good. Okay, then that's what we're gonna do. Um, the one thing I do want to note though, before we all break up is that this is in terms of his formal position on the RDAP, this is David Scher's last meeting. He has taken a job with the Cannabis Control Board as general counsel. So he will no longer be the representative from the AGO. That will be Julio Thompson, I believe. And I just wanted to publicly thank him for all. I mean, Jesus, I where to start? Um, I mean, personally, you know, phone calls at 10 o'clock at night where I'm like, David, and having a moment. So um, that's my, <laughs> really, and David, you can't see, people are waving their hands at you. Um, I was gonna say, I was gonna unmute and, and thank David, because like, he can't see us, he's on the phone. <laughs> yeah. Thank um, you, David. <laughs> yes, thank you, David. Yeah, David, this is Rebecca. Congratulations. I'm I'm so happy for you, but you have done some heavy lifting on this panel and it's been really great to work with you. And um, I hope you come back and pop in and check in and give us some, some clear eyed assessments on if we've strayed or not, but, but great. Good luck. We'll miss you. Well, thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. This panel has certainly been one of the most rewarding things I've worked on. And um, and I, I have really enjoyed working with all of you. And thanks especially to Eitan, who, as you all know, I think has, uh, is really the reason this panel has been successful in the last couple of years. So um, thank you so much for everything you've all done. And I will certainly not be a stranger. I will definitely be at the main RDAP meetings uh, as often as I can, which I, I hope will be just about all of them. And we'll, we'll keep seeing each other. But thank you all so much. It's really been a wonderful experience. Thanks, David. And thanks, everybody else. Um, have a good two weeks. And I'll see you, I don't know what, if it's the 6th, so that'll be what, the 13th will be the next time that we meet. So I will see you all then. Um, don't hesitate to get in touch, please, if you need to or want to or anything. Thank you all so much for all the work. It, this is really, it's so gratifying to just see a group of people come together and do something and really to do this kind of work. It's just been, it's just been lovely to feel the push hands and the back and forth. And I think we're really getting somewhere. So thank you all very much. And aside from everything else, have a good Labor Day.